Shalom, Reverend John Ferret here, and we're at Lesson 79 in the study of Genesis, our podcast Bible study that's called The Gospel According to Moses on the Book of Genesis. Now, we're at Genesis chapter 33, and Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, is coming home. He's got his two wives, his 11 sons, and his one daughter, Dinah. And he and his brother Esau meet again in uh, Genesis chapter 33 after all these years. And their family reunion went well. Jacob was a little fearful of Esau. He remembers Esau's words when he said, I'm going to kill Jacob after the days of the mourning of our father. That's in Genesis 27 verse 41. Now, as we're going to see, Isaac is still alive. He hasn't died yet. So even though Jacob and Esau's reunion went well, as you can read in Genesis chapter 33, verses 1 through 11, Jacob still seems cautious about his brother. And wouldn't you be? Esau had said, I'm going to kill my brother when the days of mourning for our father are over. And Esau and uh, Isaac is still alive, which we're going to see in the next lesson. Esau wants Jacob to travel with him and his 400 men, and Jacob refuses, <laughs> probably on the side of caution, and he makes a very interesting statement why he's not going to go with Esau at this time. And we need to study these words very carefully. It helps us with our understanding of the location of Mount Sinai. Again, it's, it's surprising. The text seems so unimportant. And yet, as you study these words in their historical context, the understanding of what it means is super important. At the website, www.lightofmenorah.org. And again, Light of Menorah is spelled, well, I'm not going to spell it, Menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H, and it's all one word, Light of Menorah. If you go there and you find the picture for this lesson, 79 in Genesis, underneath there, you're going to find a number of links and resources I'm going to be giving you. One of them is, where is the location of Mount Sinai? So combining that one in the study of Exodus with this one, when we're studying Genesis chapter 33, we're going to see that that one thing that Jacob says to tell Esau why he's not going to travel with him, how important that is, as it relates to the location of Mount Sinai itself. And there are other resources at the website as well, underneath the picture in the description for this session. Now Jacob parts with his brother and he crosses the Jordan and he comes to the ancient city of Shechem. And you say, wait a minute. His grandfather, Abraham, came to Shechem. Abraham came to Shechem and God said there that he t tells Abraham, I promise you all this land. Abraham camps out there at Shechem, not in the city, but someplace outside the city. He builds an altar to Yahweh, Adonai, to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Now, Jacob shows up. And he shows up like his grandpa. It's their first stop in the promised land for Jacob and Abraham, Shechem. Jacob camps out, and he buys land near Shechem. And it's very interesting because God promised Abraham the land when, when Grandpa Abraham showed up. But now Jacob's buying the land. And like Grandpa, Jacob also builds an altar to thank Yahweh Adonai. It's like the events are connected in some way. Are the events connected in some way? They are. The events at Shechem testify of Messiah Yeshua, just as he said in John chapter 5, verse 39. 
when he talked to the scribes and the chief priests and he told them that scripture testifies of him and the only scripture they had was the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, Jesus' Bible. This becomes so awesome. Wait till you see this. Are you ready? Come, let's go. Come and let's follow Jacob and his family to Shechem. Let's go to Shechem to see the promises of God to Israel and the world coming right there in reality in front of our eyes. Let's go. So let's go to Genesis chapter 33, starting in verse 13. And I'm going to read again from the Jerusalem Bible from Koran Publishers in Jerusalem. And in Genesis 33, starting in verse 13. And he said to him, My Lord knows that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds giving suck are care for me. And if they should um, overdrive them one day, all the flocks will die. Now let me just mention what's going on here. And that is Jacob is talking to Lavan, Laban, okay? So I'll be using a lot of the Hebrew pronunciations. So Yaakov is talking to Lavan. Uh, no, not Lavan, excuse me, Esau, okay? Oh, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Esav, actually, in Hebrew. And telling his brother that, no, uh, we can't go with you because we can't drive the herds and the flocks too fast. Okay, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But Jacob is talking to Esav, Esau. Uh, let the Lord, and let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over from his servant, and I will lead on slowly according to the pace of the cattle that goes before me and the children until I come to my Lord in, uh, to Seir. And uh, Esau said, or Esau said, let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, Jacob, what need is there? Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Yaakov, Jacob, journeyed to Sukkot and built him a house. Sukkot. Some of you will say, gee whiz, that's a feast that John talks about. It's in the Bible, the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's exactly what it means, Sukkot, a tabernacle. Now, I don't know, you know, if I go camping, okay, and I take my camper, I don't say I take my tabernacle, okay, why? Nobody uses that word. You know, hey, did you buy a tabernacle? Yeah, I went to Hilltop Tabernacles over there in Fridley, okay? A tabernacle is a tent, okay? A camper, uh, a portable dwelling place, okay? Uh, a shanty, okay? Uh, so that's what a Sukkot is. Matter of fact, Sukkot is plural, so it's a lot of them, okay? A sukkah is one, a Sukkot is plural. So he journeyed to Sukkot and built him a house and made boots for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. And Yaakov came to Selim, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paran Haram, and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought the piece of land on which he had spread his tent, and the hand of the children of Amar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel, God, the God of Israel. Anyway, uh, some points. There's that interesting verse in here. Uh, and you say it's not that interesting. It's actually very important. But uh, Jacob is talking to Esau. And um, he's saying that um, to him back in verse 13, the children are tender. In other words, they're young um, and, and infants. And the flocks and herds giving suck are care for me. And if they should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. You cannot, if you have herds and flocks of sheep, drive them beyond their pace. They need to graze. That's what cattle and that's what sheep do. Now we're going to come back to this later on because in Exodus 12, 38, so that means next year when we get into Exodus, if we get that far, we will, God willing, we'll get that far. 
you're going to see uh, in Exodus 12, 38, that the Hebrews left Egypt with large herds and large flocks, okay? And here we're seeing this farmer, this shepherd, Jacob, said, we can't drive them that fast. Now, what's really fascinating is scientists actually have studied the Bedouin uh, in Jordan and Israel and Arabia and to see how far they travel each day with their large flocks. Okay, when the Bedouin, especially 10, 15 years ago, they had large flocks of sheep out there and they would move. The Bedouins are nomads. And what they would find is that depending, um, they went no more than five miles per day. Now that's science, that's science, okay? That's real historical fact. And it's bit interesting because you say, wait a minute, we know how fast the Hebrews traveled. No more than five miles per day. Now, the other interesting thing, it took them 50 days to get to Sinai. And there was a problem along the way. It was called the sea, okay? Um, so let's say they traveled 50 days at five miles per day. That's 250 miles, right? Isn't that interesting? You see, this is one of those things that you need to know from real science when people start telling you where Mount Sinai is. We'll be dealing with that when we get to Exodus. This is an issue that you have to actually address. The Bible says you cannot drive your herds and your flocks too fast, other they will die. And I was with uh, a shepherd uh, in uh, Wadi Ram in Jordan, um, not far from Petra. We were up on the way up high in the mountains. And uh, we actually had the sheep, and we were going with the shepherd all day. And the sheep determined the pace that the shepherd traveled because he was watching how they would graze. And we didn't go very far. I think we went about two miles maybe, maybe three. So our travel that day was maybe six miles, which I find interesting. But we'll get to that in Exodus. I, I think you're going to find it interesting when we get, when we get to there. But again, that'll be next year. Second thing, I, and that's geography. Again, geography, the study of sheep, the study of herds, and another piece of geography, okay, is when we get to, yeah, when we get to verse 18, and in verse 18 it says, And Yaakov came to Shalom, the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And it, what's interesting then is this. Jacob comes to Shechem. This really bothered me. I remember the first time, not the first time I read this, but I read this and I said, there's something about this place. So let me give you some ideas of what's going on here. You remember that way back in Genesis chapter 12, God made some promises to Abraham, four of them, okay? I call them the four Ps. One of them, he said, I'm going to give you a place. In other words, Canaan or Canaan, okay? This is going to be your land. The other thing is, is that you're going to have a people. And you remember the one scene in Genesis 15, your descendants will number the scars in the sky. You know, so you're going to have people. You're going to have descendants. Another one, a position in the earth. You have, your, your name is going to be great. That's exactly the words that God uses. Abraham, your name will be great. And then he's got a purpose, and that's in Genesis 12, 3. And in Genesis 12, 3, through you, Abraham, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, in this class, we've already dealt with the Hebrew, uh, both last year and this year. And that phrase in Hebrew can also be interpreted as, and all the families of the earth will be grafted in. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? And Eleazar, Rabbi Eleazar of the first century, who was a contemporary of Paul, he's the guy that discovered it. He's the guy that said this could be interpreted a different way. He's a contemporary of Paul. And what did Paul say in Romans chapter 12? You've been grafted in. Isn't that fascinating? They're both alive at the same time. But at any rate, with regards to this, we have the promises is made. And when we go to uh, Genesis, if you're reading in Genesis 12, you get to Genesis 12, 6, and I'm just giving you those verses. I'm not going to look them up. They're easy to look up. The first place that Abraham stops to make a camp when he comes into Canaan, he's got to cross the Jordan River. So if you're on the other side of the Jordan River, you're not in Canaan, okay? Canaan is 
or Israel, okay, he crosses and the first place he comes to is Shechem. Abraham comes to Shechem and he builds an altar there. He builds an altar to give praises unto Adonai. What, what does Jacob do? He comes to Shechem. It's his first place with the entire family. He builds an altar there. On top of that, he buys a piece of land for 100 pieces of money, okay, as it says in this translation. So here's Shechem, the promises of God, and we see that the person who has been given the promises of God, Abraham, shows at shows Shechem. And now the promises are growing because now Jacob shows up and you got the family. You got the 11 boys and the sister. You would say Dinah, her actual name is actually Dina, so I'll be using that pronunciation, it's Dina. So one family now with the promises of God because remember God comes to Jacob and says, you have the same thing. Now and a little bit later on, let me read, no, I won't read it right now, but it's in Joshua chapter 8. And in Joshua chapter 8, starting in verse 30, and let's see if I've got that marked. Let's see if I've got that marked. Yes, I do. Joshua chapter 8, verse 30. I want you to hear this. Then Yehoshua, that's Joshua's name, Yehoshua. By the way, Yehoshua, and Jesus' name, Yeshua, Yeshua is the shortened version of Yehoshua. It's the same name, but one's the short version because Yehoshua says, God is my salvation. Yeshua is salvation. So it's the shorter version. That's important. Then Yehoshua built an altar to the Lord of Israel in Mount Ebal, Mount Ebal, as Moshe, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the Torah of Moshe an altar of whole stones over which no man lifted up an iron implement, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And a little bit later on, in 33, uh, half of the people are over on Mount Gerizim and half of them are over on Mount Ebal as Moshe, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. You remember that? God commanded Moses to say, take the people, put half on Gerizim, half on Ebal, and then go through the blessings and the curses. Get what, guess what cities right in between mountains? Shechem. One man shows up at Shechem who has the promises of God. Now the promises are expanding. Remember what God said? You're going to have people. So what does he get? A family of 11 boys with Dina. Okay, Benjamin hasn't been born yet. He shows up at Shechem. So after the one family, who shows up next? Joshua with the entire nation. That is just amazing. But we're not done. So I'm going to go to the ESV translation of the Bible. I'm going to be in the New Testament. And I'm in John chapter 4. And in John chapter 4, we read, starting in verse 1, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although John himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for the Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jacob's well. That's interesting. So Jesus wearied, oh, Jesus was wearied uh, from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Okay, Sikar is the New Testament city. It's a village. Sikar, part of that village, was built inside the ruins of Shechem. One man shows up at Shechem with the promises of God. The first time in Israel, the first time in Canaan. The next one is Jacob, the family with the 11 boys in Dina, because Benjamin's not, and he shows up. Where? Shechem. This is the first time. And by the way, before he crossed the river, Jordan, he was at the Jabbok stream. His name was changed. He comes into Canaan and his name is Israel. Right before this event. Then, now we have Joshua coming with the entire nation. And now we have, finally, he who will be the one. So that all of the families of the earth will be grafted in. The promises of God are demonstrated at Shechem. Why? I have no idea. 
I find that just amazing. And whose bones are buried there. We'll back to him later on, okay? Joseph. So now you'll remember that Abraham coined the phrase Jehovah Jireh. You can find this in Genesis 22, okay? And that is, he says Jehovah Jireh, he names a place called Jehovah Jireh because God provided the ram as a substitute sacrifice for his son Isaac. And everybody says Jehovah Jireh. Problem is, there are no J's in Hebrew, okay? Um, and on top of that, Jehovah is a made up word. If you're interested, I'll send you the article on that. Some monk back in about the 15th century or 14th century was reading Hebrew and he didn't know how to read, read Hebrew and he misinterpreted everything. So he took it from the actual Hebrew and he took it into Greek and to Latin and said Jehovah. It's a made up word by some Roman monk from 15th century or something like that. But anyway, he, he, was, he tried, okay, but it stuck. It doesn't work, okay. But anyway, the actual Hebrew is Yahweh Yirah, all right? And in the Hebrew, it means, okay, the Lord will see. That's what it means. The Lord will see his sacrifice. So that's what, Mo, that's what Abraham is doing. The Lord will see. He, however, it can also be used to provide. So you, it's two different ways. In other words, to see, to provide, to provide, to see where is it, that which I'm going to provide, where is it, I'm looking for it, it this conceptual meaning of Hebrew. So God helped him. And at Shechem, we can say, Yahweh Yira. The Lord is making us see the promises of God. Just amazing. But why that city? And again, I don't know. It, 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 is, it is amazing. The disciples in Jesus' day, let's take them. They don't have a Torah. I mean, they don't have a New Testament. So when they're reading or they hear of the event with the Samaritan woman, okay, or maybe it's after the event of the Samaritan woman, and perhaps they're having lunch on their way to the Galilee, because I know if you're going to walk from Sikar up to Nazareth or to Capernaum, uh, you got a long walk. So they're going to stop for lunch or dinner someplace along the line. And I can imagine Jesus saying, so we were at Sakaar, right? Yeah. Who was here? Did Jesus go through the geography because they knew it and told them, don't you remember Avraham was here? Don't you remember that Yaakov was here? Don't you remember that Yehoshua was here? Look at the promises of Abraham. Or did they get it later? I, I don't know. Interesting. But they had no New Testament. They would remember Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph. And perhaps for them, they got it. Perhaps for them. they. Had, but it's geography is a key. I was uh, talking with a gentleman today who happened to be in Israel last week. And uh, he was telling me that he got to Masada. He got to the old city of Jerusalem. And he said, every place I went, he said, John, I was thinking about you. And I said, that, that's not a good thing. No, that's not a good thing. Um, but just joking around, and he said, but it was, you were talking about how geography is so important, and he said, this blew me away. Just to see how small the old city is? And I said, yeah, that's about the size of it was at Jesus' day. I mean, very, very close. Uh, the old city now is about one mile square. Uh, a little bit bigger in Jesus' day with the gates. But uh, geography is so important, and it's important for us as well. But I wanted to share that with you because that thing on Shechem, really, uh, when I first discovered this, it was a number of years ago, and I've shared it in my classes. Until recently, there's a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, um, and I was studying about Shechem, and he said, isn't it amazing that the promises of God were shown at Shechem? First, it's Abraham. Now, this guy is not Christian, okay? First, it's Abraham, and then it's Jacob, and then it's Joshua. The promises of God are, what's next? I would love to have a conversation with him. Look who shows up next. Amazing stuff. So I have provided a number of additional resources for your continued study. So like I said, at the website, below the picture for this lesson, Genesis number 79, you're going to find links to various resources. Now remember, the website is www.lightofmenorah, 
diet.org and light menorah is just treated as one word menorah again is spelled m-e-n-o-r-a-h so there's one link there to my video lessons that are all five minutes in length on shikim it will go in depth on what we just learned here in this podcast where yahweh adonai and his promises become visible in front of our eyes at Shechem. A second is an article on that concept that I brought up in this podcast that Jehovah is a mistaken translation for God's name. We find out that it's not biblical and definitely not God's name. So you're going to have a couple of links there to actually go into that a little bit further and again there's other resources there as well so we're at Shechem and we're ready to study the rape of Jacob's daughter Dina and we along with many Jewish and Christian scholars and I mean credible scholars ask what is this story doing here What's the purpose? We're going to deal with that in Lesson 80. So until then, to Lesson 80, I bid you and wish you God's Shalom.